Amen. Amen. Okay, so we've been in a series called I Can't Believe That This Is In The Bible. And it's been a really fun series for me because it's kind of a, it's a different way of prepping for a sermon. And it's a different kind of, um, yeah, it's just been fun. It's been, it's been really neat. I hope it's been neat for you. The first week we talked about, uh, if you guys remember, JL, who was just this amazing woman that drove a stake through, uh, through the, the, the head, of, through a skull, and pinned a guy down into the ground. And that was pretty hardcore. And then in week two, we talked about this amazing gift of mothers and what it was really like for Moses' mom to, to push him out into the, the basket, out into the water, and how heartbreaking and heart-wrenching that that was, but celebrating the kind of love that God's put in mothers. And, and this week, what we're talking about is we're, I've titled this week's message, The, the Writing on the Wall. Now, uh, every week, I've specifically kind of chosen titles that would go with what it is that we're talking about. So last week was about Moses floating the basket. So we chose the title Hope Floats. And so this week it's, it's the writing on the wall. That's a, a story that we're going to talk about. But before we get into that, some of you may know this here. If you were born around the 1990s, the writing on the wall is also known as a Destiny's Child album. <laughs> so for those of you pre-Beyonce, if I said the writing on the wall and you thought about uh, Destiny's Child, then, well, we are kindred spirits, because somehow this is what popped into my head as I was preparing this sermon here, but, but this isn't what we're, so this isn't exactly what we're talking about today, but I do think it's important that some of us know that there was something before Beyonce, so some of you that are, that are, are young don't realize that, that she didn't do this, song. okay, that's a tangent. So we're not talking about this, but what we are talking about with the writing on the wall is it's actually, it's an idiomatic expression. And so what is that? When we say the words, the writing on the wall, and I remember my dad saying this to me growing up, like, son, you need to, you better see the writing on the wall here. You know, it's like a, a warning, an idiomatic expression that suggests a portent of doom or misfortune. Now, when I looked up this definition here, I thought, well, I don't know what the word Portent means, and I bet none of you do either. So I've defined it. So the definition of portent is is this here. It's going to put on the screen a sign of warning that a momentous or calamitous event is likely to happen. And then I thought, I wonder if people know what calamitous. But I stopped. I said, I'm not going <laughs> to continue to define that. You know, I I read it for myself. But basically, what we're saying here is this: is that something really heavy is about to go down. And that, that's a phrase, the writing on the wall, that we have, has been used um, so much so that it's become a part of, of many cultures and, and almost like centuries of people. It, and, it, and it means that there's something coming. There's something heavy coming. And it's something that, that's very much like a secular thing. In fact, when I was looking this up, I thought, wait a minute, does the secular version of this, that thing that my dad would always tell me when I was little... Is that the thing that is derived from what we're going to learn about today in the Bible? And I thought, no, can't, those two can't be connected. But actually, they are connected. See, the saying, the writing on the wall, it, it, it starts back with the story that we're going to look at today. And, and there's a picture here. A man, a very famous artist named Rembrandt. Rembrandt painted this picture here. And this is a picture of, of a, the, the king of Babylon at the time. And we'll get into his name and his story and behind him, there's a hand. There's a ghostly hand. And he sees the fingers of the hand writing on the wall. And it's through this story. And when I say the word story, this is, a, this is an actual event. It's recorded not only biblically, but also in Babylonian documents and, and their archives and history. This is something that really, really happened. But it was so impactful that it made its way even into our culture and eventually into a Destiny's Child album. So it all started here with this, and this is what we're going to unpack today. But this moment that you see, this picture, that Rembrandt so specifically picked out and so specifically painted and portrayed, this is the moment that we're going to look at today. Every week we've looked at a moment and we've had a, a takeaway, just one simple takeaway, and looked at, at one simple moment. But just like we've done every other week, we can't just dive into the moment here without knowing a little bit about what's going on behind it. And so before we can understand this writing on the wall thing, we've got to get a better understanding of a guy named Daniel. 
And we talked about Daniel quite a lot lately. And if you're interested in your Bible and the, the crazy stuff going on in the Bible, you know, this is Daniel. This is Daniel from the lion's den, Daniel. And, and if you want to know like wild stuff, just read the book of Daniel. The, the first part of Daniel is almost like a chronological timeline of just crazy event after crazy event after crazy event. And then the, the second part of it is a lot of like um, prophecy, like Daniel seeing visions, being given visions from God and, and telling those visions and doing things with that. And that may, for some of you, that may get a little bit heavy. And that's okay if that's you. If you love Daniel and then you get to chapter 8 and you're like, what is going on here? That's fine. It's totally fine. Enjoy the first seven chapters. It's like an amazing story. And then we can help you understand the rest of it. But we've got to understand Daniel. Now, Daniel, he has the, his own book in the Bible. He was a real person. Daniel actually, and it, it makes it easy because we can just go through chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 and understand more about Daniel. So Daniel, chapter 1 is this, capture and assimilation. So Daniel is a Jewish person. So he, he's a Jew, meaning he's living in Jerusalem, meaning he's an Israelite, meaning he comes from the, the tribes of Israel, meaning he's a descendant of Abraham. Daniel's one of those people, the set apart, the chosen, one of God's favorite people. That's Daniel. And he's living in Jerusalem, which is kind of David's, uh, you know, would be David's glorious city, would be kind of the, even still today, it's the hot spot of what's happening spiritually around the world. And Daniel's there. And it's this great walled city. But something happens. This nation of Babylon it rises in power, and it rises in strength. And as it rises and rises and rises, it finally conquers Jerusalem. And it takes captive the Israelites. And so now Daniel, in chapter 1, we see that they are captured. And as they capture people, they like to do this thing where they say, Okay, if we think that you're valuable or you're worthy, then we'll keep you alive, and we'll take you with us, and we'll fully assimilate you into our culture. So we're going to change your diet we're going to change your name. We're going to educate you. We're going to make sure you, you learn our traditions and learn our ways. And it's like they're fully absorbing the person into their culture. And so Daniel was one of these amazing guys, good looking, uh, super talented, really smart, kind of a standout guy. And he set aside and said, no, no, this is a great one. Let's bring him with us. So he's captured and then he's assimilated. Now, what Daniel does on this kind of assimilation is when he's brought into, um, into Babylon, he's brought in and they say, okay, here's what you're going to eat. And he says, nah, I don't want to eat that. And that's where he comes up with the Daniel diet. So if anyone's ever been forced to do the Daniel diet, this is, you can go to chapter one here in Daniel. You can get mad at that, not get mad at the person that's forcing you to do it. But this is where Daniel said, no, I don't want to eat your meat and your fancy stuff. Let me have twigs and berries and lick the dirt off the bottom of leaves, and you'll see that I'm much healthier than any of your other men. And then he does that, and it turns out you know, he is healthy. And, and so Daniel stands up for some of his things that he's not going to compromise on, which he was one of the few that did that. And so Daniel would grow, and he would prove his point, prove his point to the king, prove his point to kind of the whole kingdom of Babylon that that. What he had was special, and he wasn't going to let go of that. He wasn't going to give that up. And so then we go into chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2. This is where you've got Neb's dream, do or die. Oh, good old Neb here is actually short for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is a famous king uh, for the kingdom of Babylon. Essentially, Nebuchadnezzar was the dude that had the ability to finally conquer Israel and Jerusalem. This was something that even God talked about. God said many times, Israel, hey, you're not doing things right. I'm a, do you want to do this the hard way or the easy way? I've talked about this before, but with, with Benjamin, our son, he, he always has two choices. He's the maker of his destiny. Benjamin, you want today to be the hard way or the easy way? And he'll say, easy. But it doesn't count when you say easy while you throw something and stomp your feet and fling your body on the ground like a four-year-old knows how to do. And so Benjamin will scream and he'll throw a fit, but he'll say, I want it to be the easy way, but his body is saying that he wants it to be the hard way. And that's kind of like, uh, like Israel at the time is they're saying, oh, we, God, we want to do it the easy way. But their body and their actions were actually saying, we kind of want to do this the hard way. We don't want to obey you. We don't want to follow you. And God says, okay, 
I'm going to hand you over into the hand of the Babylonians. And he chooses Nebuchadnezzar to raise up in power so that Nebuchadnezzar can take over Israel and Jerusalem. And this guy, Nebuchadnezzar, who him and Daniel are eventually going to kind of become friends, this guy is a, is a ruthless leader. And in chapter 2, you see this, this story unfold where Nebuchadnezzar is hanging out in his palace. And he's, he, he knows that he's conquered the land. He knows he's the most powerful leader. He's hanging out. He's chilling. And he, he didn't have Netflix at the time, so there's no Netflix and chill. There's, I don't know what he was doing, but he's just chilling. And, and the, the scripture actually says that you know, while he was relaxing in his palace, you know, he has a, a dream that startles him. And so what he does is he has this dream, and it bothers him. It scares him. And so when he has the dream, this is, kind of, this is, to me, it's funny. When he has the dream, see, it's hard to tell the most powerful person in the world that they're a psycho, right? But often, you know, when you look back on it, you're like, you are an absolute psychopath. So he has this dream, and he says, okay, I, I'm going to um, get someone to interpret this, but I'm, gonna make, I'm also not going to tell them the dream. So not only do, does his... Uh, leaders have to tell him the interpretation of the dream, but they also have to tell him what the actual dream was. Because Nebuchadnezzar was like, well, anyone could translate or interpret something if I tell you what the dream is. But instead, in order to test my people, my magis, my sorcerers, my, my smart people, you're going to tell me what my dream was. And they're like, that's absolutely impossible. And he says, okay, well, if you can't do it, then we'll get into that. Let's look here at exactly what he says. So in chapter 2 of Daniel, and what we, we jump in here on verse 2, and Nebuchadnezzar, he's had the dream, and he's bothered. He's really bothered by it. And so what he does is he gives a command to call the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. So he tells them from the beginning, you're going to come in and you're going to tell me what my dream was. And so all the sorcerers, I mean, imagine the sorcerers, the magi, the smart people, the, 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 the future seers, they all come in and they line up in front of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's standing there looking at them and he says, okay, tell me my dream. And they have this dialogue back and forth and they say, this is actually impossible. We can't tell you. Your dream, we can only interpret what you tell us. And he says, well, too bad. Tell me the dream and interpret it. And they're a little bit taken aback by this. And so they actually tell him, we, we, we can't do that. That's not the way this works. You don't understand how interpretation works, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar says, you don't understand how our relationship works. When I say to do something, you do it. Otherwise, there's a consequence. There's a hard way. There's a bad way. You're choosing the bad way. And so he goes on, he gets a little bit upset with, with all these smart people in the room that can't tell him his dream. And so he replies to them, my command is firm and unchangeable. This sounds like every Sunday morning or Tuesday afternoon in my household. Benjamin, my command is firm and unchangeable. And so he says, if you do not reveal to me the content of the dream along with its interpretation. Now, this is where it's very different in my household, okay? This is, this is, we, I want to back up a little bit. We do not condone violence in the Ladd family household, but Nebuchadnezzar does. And so he says, if you don't do this, you shall be cut into pieces. That's aggressive, very aggressive. And you shall be made, your house shall be made a heap of rubbish. I mean, that, that is just uh, a pretty intense thing there. I'll cut you into pieces, and you should be made into a heap of rubbish. And so they find out that Nebuchadnezzar is really going to hold them to this. Now, here comes Daniel. Daniel, who is one of these smart people, finds out that Nebuchadnezzar wants the dream to be told and interpreted. And so Daniel, in a, a sense of survival for himself, gets his friends together, and he says, we better pray, or otherwise we're going to get cut into pieces. So Daniel's not necessarily motivated by, he doesn't float in on a godly cloud and say, I have your dream, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I, there's a, probably a bit of panic in Daniel as he hears 
that Nebuchadnezzar is going to cut a bunch of people into pieces if they can't interpret a dream that no one's ever heard about. And so Daniel goes in to his friends and he says, we need to pray, we need to seek God on this. And they pray, and then God gives Daniel the dream. And so that goes to, to we jump forward in chapter 2 to this moment. Or we, we read this, but if you tell me, okay, so I forgot this. The king actually tells the guys, uh, you could get cut into pieces, or incentive would be that if you tell me the content of the dream, along with its interpretation, then you shall receive from me gifts and, regor- and rewards so great in honor. So tell me the dream and its interpretation. It's Nebuchadnezzar's, he's trying to spin this like, this is only good for you. I don't understand why you're complaining. You only can win here at this. And so, you know, the, the, everyone thinks here that everyone dies. It's, this is the mentality that Daniel goes away with, is that everyone is now going to die. Because no one can predict this king's dream. So it goes on in verse 19, and, and it says that, uh, because of this, the king was indignant and extremely furious, and he gave a command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So this is the Bible unpacking what I just told you. And it goes on in verse 13, and it says, So the decree went out that the wise men were to be killed, and they looked for Daniel and his companions to put them to death. Now this is where Daniel goes to prayer. And what ends up happening, quite simply, Daniel prays, God gives him the dream. Daniel then goes to the king's bodyguard and says, buy me a little bit of time. I think I can get the dream. The bodyguard buys him time. Daniel goes in front of the king, says, here's your dream, and here's the interpretation of it. And, and the king, Nebuchadnezzar, says, you nailed it. You got it. You hit the nail right on the head. And so all of Daniel's mates and all the other wise men are like, whew, you know, we all get to live. Not everyone's going to die today. And Nebuchadnezzar elevates Daniel into a position of authority and trust and and power. And so you see Nebuchadnezzar do this crazy thing. Daniel responds through the grace of God, through God uh, establishing the dream to Daniel. And Daniel does what everyone else said was actually impossible because it was. It needed God to do it for it to become possible. And so then we fast forward into Daniel chapter 3. Now this is a, a chapter where Daniel kind of takes a nap. And this is where we focus on the fiery furnace. So I know we've all heard the story. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, they refuse to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar makes this big image out of himself, out of gold, and decrees that when it goes down the road, everyone has to bow down and worship it. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were officials of Nebuchadnezzar. Why were they officials of Nebuchadnezzar? Because they'd been promoted because Daniel guessed the dream. Why does Nebuchadnezzar have a giant golden thing that he's rolling through the streets for people to worship? Because Daniel revealed it in his dream. It's just crazy how all these things tie together. So Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar about this statue in his dream. Nebuchadnezzar builds it. And then these three that are put into power because of their association with Daniel now won't bow down and worship that that image that's being drugged down the street. And so they get thrown into the fiery furnace. And this is that that amazing story that I don't have time to fully unpack. But this is Daniel chapter 3. And they're taken to a heated furnace and they're thrown into it. And it was so hot that the men of Nebuchadnezzar's army are burned up and die. But the men that are thrown in, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they live. And not only do they live, not a single hair is burnt. And the king looks through and he sees four people walking around. Not three. The angel of the Lord is with them and protects them. So they come out of the fiery furnace unscathed. Nebuchadnezzar, now he's freaking out. He's like, there's really something here. And so he's driven to worship God. He's driven to recognize God even more. So now we can go on to chapter 4 as we look through Daniel's life here. And I've titled this chapter, Mad Cow Disease. And this is Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. Now, this dream is is a little bit easier because Nebuchadnezzar has a bad dream. And instead of telling people, I'm going to kill everyone that can't tell me the dream and interpret that dream, he says, bring all the smart people in the room, and then he tells them the dream. And I think that's because Daniel was in the room. And because he knew that if one of the others tried to interpret the dream selfishly or wrongly, 
And Daniel would call them out on it. See, I believe that Nebuchadnezzar had built some trust with Daniel. And that Daniel brought a sense of security to King Nebuchadnezzar. And so the king tells this dream that he has. And Daniel uh, interprets it. And he, he kind of has some bad news for him. He says, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, you, you're going to be, you are this great God-given power. In the dream, he's a tree. And I think of the movie Avatar. This tree of life that just encompasses the whole world and provides food and provides um, nourishment to everything. And that was Nebuchadnezzar because God had put him into a position of power as the king of Babylon to overthrow Jerusalem and Israel. So God grew him like a tree. But then in his dream, the tree, it gets cut off. And then it gets uh, bound with iron and brass to keep it from growing back. And so Nebuchadnezzar's like, what does this mean? And Daniel tells him, well, the tree is you. You're going to be cut off. You're going to be bound because you've taken your eyes off of God. And then he, he actually goes on to tell him this part of his dream. And he says, Nebuchadnezzar, actually what's going to happen is you're going to be driven from mankind. And your dwelling place shall be with the beasts of the field, the cows. He's going to live with the cows. And that you will be given grass to eat like the cattle, and you will be wet with the dew of heaven. Meaning he's going to sleep outside at night. So he's telling the most powerful man on the planet that he's going to go live with the cows and eat grass and sleep outside at night. And then he goes on, and he continues to translate, and he says, And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know without any doubt that the Most High God rules over the kingdom of mankind, and he bestows it to whomever he desires. Now, for Nebuchadnezzar, this is a way complex way to teach a lesson to this guy. He could have learned it in, in a lot of different ways. But what God is doing is God is saying, I'm going to completely remove you from the throne. And not only am I going to remove you, I'm going to make you go crazy for a period of seven. And some people say seven days, seven years. I, I think it's definitely longer than a day because the scripture talks about that while he goes crazy, his, his hair grew out like feathers of a bird and his nails grew out like talons of an eagle. And so that, that doesn't happen overnight. Some of you guys have been trying to grow facial hair and hair for years, and it's still not come in, you know? So, th so th this is what he tells him. It's a very complex way to teach a lesson. You know, God goes through making a man kind of crazy for this. And, and what, what happens is a year later, a year after Daniel tells him this, Nebuchadnezzar's walking around on the top of one of his walls talking about how amazing his kingdom is that he created and that he earned and that he fought for. And boom, in that moment, a voice from heaven says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are now arrogant, you're prideful, and I'm taking it all away from you. And he immediately went to live in the fields with the animals. And they, the, the commentaries that I read said probably they sectioned him off into a part of the wilderness and Daniel and some of the other officials ran the kingdom for that time period. And then seven years later, or seven periods of time later, Nebuchadnezzar looks up into the sky and he honors God for who he is. And when he honors God for who he is, he's immediately restored. I don't mean like a, a poof. I would expect that first shower was kind of probably pretty rough for whatever assistant had to take out seven years worth of mud and dirt and fingernails and all of that stuff, but he was restored. Now, what's so special about this, and this is the, the end of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar's story, is what you see here is you see something that carries on even to us today. See, we look at Israel as the good people, and we look at, at Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar as the bad people, and he was a bad person. But God raised up that bad person to teach Israel a lesson of humility and honor. But in God using a bad guy to teach a lesson of humility and honor, God draws closer to Nebuchadnezzar and he gives Nebuchadnezzar opportunity after opportunity to draw closer to him. And it turns out God actually also loves Nebuchadnezzar so much that he sends Daniel so that Nebuchadnezzar can have a relationship with God. I found a, a sentence in the commentary I want to read to you here. This is so good. 
the great and mighty persecutor of Israel, that's Nebuchadnezzar, the destroyer of Jerusalem, that's Nebuchadnezzar. He was humbled by God's grace and brought to confess God's mercy. God used Daniel's faithfulness to bring light to this Gentile. See, before there was a Paul taking the gospel to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, there was God using Daniel through interpretation of dreams, turning the most powerful man on the planet crazy into thinking that he's a cow for seven years just so that he could understand the mercy of God, so that he would confess with his tongue the goodness of God. That it's not about him, it's about God. Do we think that all this happens when Jesus comes? Jesus comes, he gives you forgiveness, you choose Jesus, you go to heaven. But in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament here, there's story after story after story of God intervening in people that were not Jewish and intervening in their lives so that they have an opportunity to know God. So I just I look at this statement, and to me it's an incredible journey of a boy being taken from Israel, growing up and into the Babylonian system, gaining influence, barely escaping death, his friends being thrown into a fire, barely escaping death. This King Nebuchadnezzar two or three, four times worships God, then turns around and stops worshiping God. And then Daniel tells him the worst possible thing ever. You're going to lose everything you have. You're going to live in the dirt. And you're only going to get it back when you recognize that God is the greatest and that he is the one that gave this to you. And then that happens. I mean, that, that, that to me is just crazy that that's even in the Bible, that that's there. That that story of how, and this is what got me the most, God used Daniel's faithfulness to bring light to the Gentile. See, the, the Gentile, that, that, again, that's the person after Jesus came that wasn't a Jewish person. That's, that's all of Paul's stuff. And for some reason, we don't think about that there's a history of God pursuing the non-believer from way before Jesus came in the New Testament. It's all the way back into the setting up and tearing down and setting up and tearing down of the Jewish nation, of the Israelites. That nowhere in history is God not willing to do something to chase down the Gentile, the non-believer, the non-Jewish person of the time. And that, that to me is just an incredible Thing, how God used Daniel to do that. So now we get into kind of where we started, which is with Daniel and, and his journey here with, with the king in chapter 5. And this is uh, Belshazzar. I, I have, thank you. It's actually Daniel 5, not Daniel 2. That's my typo. Belshazzar's feast. I've said that word so many times in the last 48 hours. And I didn't even try and tell you this, but Daniel's uh, Babylonian name was this with a T in it, Belshazzar. And Belshazzar was basically the female version of Belshazzar, which I, I thought that was also kind of funny. So Belshazzar, he's the king that takes over after Nebuchadnezzar. And if you read your Bible, it can maybe be a little bit uh, confusing. And I, please go read it uh, because it talks about all kinds of crazy stuff with whose dad was who and who belonged to who and whose mom produced what child. And this is one of those situations of did he marry his sister or not so we don't really know but Nebuchadnezzar is basically Belshazzar's grandfather and in the Bible Belshazzar references Nebuchadnezzar as his father but in the Aramaic which is the language that this specific area of the book was written in the word for father also could mean ancestor it it, it could mean something more than just uh, like the way we see it as a biological father so I want you to put your mind into place here. You have, you have the kingdom of Babylon was brought up into a huge position of authority. They take over Jerusalem. They take over Israel. Nebuchadnezzar does this amazing thing where he destroys all of Israel. And turns out it's to position Israel into a better place of favor to help them. God shows up because he loves Nebuchadnezzar. He uses Daniel, a faithful servant. And all of this, this happens. And after... Nebuchadnezzar's final dream, and when he's restored, he finally praises God fully. He says, okay, God, I, it's, it's, I'm done 
waffling back and forth. You are just the almighty God, the only creator. I'm only here because of your mercy and your grace, period, over and done. And then he dies. 23 years later, you've got this punk, Belshazzar, sitting on the throne. And he didn't earn it. He doesn't deserve it. He's, uh, he's not a great person. And he doesn't remember anything that should have been learned from his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. It's not like it was a 200-year period. 23 years later, we see Belshazzar taking over. And here's how this chapter opens in Daniel 5 here. And this is our story. Belshazzar the king, who is the descendant of Nebuchadnezzar, he gave a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking his wine in the presence of the thousand guests. So I wanted you guys to understand the context around that. He's the descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. Why is that important? Well, because now you understand how important Nebuchadnezzar was. And if you know how important Nebuchadnezzar was, then you would assume that a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar would have learned some of the lessons that Nebuchadnezzar learned. But he doesn't. Why is it important that he's having a great feast for thousands of his nobles? Well, because at the time, you need to know that Babylon was one of the most powerful nations in the entire world, that God had raised them up as a great nation. So they had incredible influence, incredible wealth. And this dude, who doesn't remember the lessons of his grandfather, is having a bunch of people around, and they're getting hammered on wine. And while they're getting hammered, he says, you know what? I've got kind of a weird flex. You, you guys know what that means. Some people know what that means. The people that know what that means are saying, why is he using that? Because he's, <laughs> he's old. He shouldn't be saying that. The rest of you are like, what's he talking about? You know? So Belshazzar has a weird flex. And that means that he's going to be like, look at what I can do here. So in verse two, this is what he says. He says, as he tasted the wine, he gave a command to bring in the gold and silver vessels, which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, this is actually his grandfather, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and guests might drink from them. This is why this is important. Nebuchadnezzar was the one that took over Israel. They conquered Jerusalem. When they did, they cleaned out the temple. They took all the gold and they melted it down and they made things with it. They took all the silver, the copper, the ornate things, and they put it away in their treasure house. Well, one night, Belshazzar's hammered with his buddies. And he says, wouldn't it be better if we drank out of the cups that were in the temple of that horrible nation that my granddad conquered a long time ago? Servants, go and bring us all of those things. And so he says, let's drink from those things. And then in the next verse, we see that in verse 3, they bring all that to him, and they brought the silver and gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, they all drank from them. So this is, God's getting his buttons pushed here, all right? He's, he's really had, he's been patient for 23 years with Belshazzar, and now this guy's finally pushed a little bit too far. So it goes on in verse 4, and it says, it says this. It says, They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Now, I talked about things being aggressive before, that Nebuchadnezzar was aggressive with how he threatened his people. This also is quite an aggressive move of Belshazzar. And he knew what he was doing here. He was essentially taking the, the coveted elements from one of the most coveted temples, one of the most holy places. Even Nebuchadnezzar recognized the power that was in Jerusalem and, and the, 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 the power and the influence that came from the Jerusalem, from the temple of the Israelites there. And Belshazzar aggressively says, I just, we're going to take all that and we're going to drink out of that stuff. And that's an aggressive move. And because of that aggressive move, God finally, 23 years later, responds. And he says this in, in verse 5. This is the moment where suddenly a man's fingers, or the fingers of a man's hand, began and appeared, and it was writing opposite the lampstand. This is important. See, the Bible's cool. It's not that it was writing in a dark corner. No, the hand actually started writing on the wall that was being lit by the lampstand. 
because he wanted to make sure that everyone in the room could see it. So God's not super confident in Belshazzar's peripheral vision or his ability to understand what's happening outside of his face in the room. And so he says, I'm going to do it right in front of his face. So these fingers appear, and the fingers start to write on the wall. And when the king saw that part of the hand that was writing, he, he, he would end up getting terrified. And it goes on to say in the next verse, it says, Then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him. The joints and muscles of his hips and back weakened, and his knees began to knock together. And that finally, apologetically, 35 minutes later, brings us to this point here. Then trigger this picture. Thanks, Philippe. Ready, go. I really, I built this thing up for so long, you know. Uh, I almost turned it off, so let's do it again. No. This, 35 minutes later, brings us to this point here, all right? See, it's one thing for you to look at this picture or for me to just say, look at what happened with the writing on the wall. But it's another thing for you to understand that behind these hands... It's an angry God that went through so much trouble, not only for Israel's sake, but also for Babylon's sake. And behind this picture, there is a, a, a king, a man, Belshazzar, who doesn't understand the, the significance of his grandfather, doesn't understand the significance of his culture, and again, doesn't understand the power and the authority of God. It took Nebuchadnezzar a long time to figure it out. Now, Belshazzar, he should have learned it faster because all the things that Nebuchadnezzar would have learned would have been passed down to him. All he would have had to have done is learn and absorb it. But he didn't. He was drinking. He was arrogant. He was full of himself. And so God responds faster with him. And he doesn't give him an option for uh, restoration. And so this moment happens. Belshazzar, terrified. His knees knock. Another translation of the Aramaic is that his bowels were loosened. That's, that, that's, that is true, you know? So, you know, you don't know what's going on under all those robes. But what I do know is the very next thing that happens, and this is even more embarrassing, is the queen mother has a suggestion. Basically, the, the mother comes in and says, Why are you so afraid? What's wrong with you? Look at what you've done to your robe. You guys are sitting around drinking, and you see the hand on the wall. By the way, the hand st stays there. Uh, I, I think of Adam's family and Thing writing on the wall, and then it kind of takes a seat and hangs out while the queen mother gives uh, Belshazzar a suggestion. She says, you need to call on Daniel. Daniel is this guy that your grandfather used, and you should use him as well because he's known for interpreting those things. And so... And the next verse we have is that after she makes the suggestion, he, he uh, where is this here? The thing, but when his heart was lifted up and spirit became so proud. Okay, so when, Philippe, go on to the next verse there. Okay, so here Daniel comes into the room and Daniel interprets this dream for him based on his mother's suggestion. Bring Daniel in, let him interpret it. And so while they're still there, and while the hand is still there, while all the friends and everybody are still there, Daniel gives the interpretation of this dream. And, and unfortunately, Belshazzar, he's not humbled in his heart or in his mind. And even though he knew all about Nebuchadnezzar, he still decides to exalt in himself. So what Daniel does is when he enters the room with Nebuchadnezzar, or with Belshazzar, he says, listen, punk, your grandfather, he learned about God, and he eventually got it right. You don't even have it in your heart to learn about God and to get it right. And so what he does is he compares Belshazzar with Nebuchadnezzar. And he says, Nebuchadnezzar was this, you instead are like this instead. And Daniel does not give him any leeway or any room. So think back to that picture, the hand on the wall, Belshazzar standing there, scared to death. And the hand has written something on the wall that no one can translate. And Daniel, he walks in, and without a hesitation, he just reads the words. And we like to think that this is some kind of cryptic sort of uh, message. And maybe it was, but probably 
not. It probably just was something that people couldn't understand or apply to the situation. And so what the hand wrote on the wall, which is what all of us want to know, is, is, is many, many, and Philippe's got it, he'll put up there, many, who, who can say this? Many, many, tekel uprising. You said it wrong, I said it right. So what this means is numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. This, wasn't, this was Aramaic, it's normal Aramaic. Daniel walks in, this is what's written on the wall. And he says, okay, these are actually four measures of coins, four different measures of currency. But when Daniel applies you know, the vowels to the Aramaic, it changes the, the meaning, changes the way that it can come across. And so he says, okay, this is how it's translated, numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. And what he says, he says, Belshazzar, your days are numbered and they're almost done. Belshazzar, you, you are weighed and you are found to come up short. Meaning you not you have not lived up to what you could have lived up to. You have been measured and found to be a lie, found to be false. And he says, Belshazzar, your kingdom is going to be divided. Your kingdom will be torn. Babylon will no longer be the greatest nation. Instead, it is going to split between the Persians and the Medes. And in that moment, when that translation had been given, Belshazzar, so arrogant, he says, Daniel, thank you. And he gives him the reward that he said he would give him, a purple cloak to signify authority and, and royalty. He gives him a gold chain around his neck to signify a position of authority. And he says, you can be the next greatest king in this nation. And Daniel says, I don't want any of that stuff. And right after that, Belshazzar's luck runs out because the surrounding area had the Persians surrounding, uh, surrounding Babylon. And they were just watching Belshazzar just drink the night away. And then when they see that he's drunk and everyone's drunk, they actually rush in and they kill everyone. Belshazzar is slain that night. Belshazzar's pride leads him to being dealt with by God Daniel translates what's going to happen, and immediately after that, he's slain and he's put to death. And then the kingdom is split between the Persians and the Medes. I mean, how arrogant of a person do you have to be to be getting, not only getting drunk, but also flashing all of your most valuable possessions while you know there's an enemy encamped around you? See, that's how full of himself that he was. And so... What does this mean for us? This is, your, this is your point that I want you to take away with you today, and, and then we're going to wrap up here. What this means for you today is this, is that, is that God, through the beginning of time until now, He wants to be your God. It's that simple. God wants to be your God. God wants you to recognize Him as God. God is a jealous God. He's a loving God. But, really, but, but what that means is that God wants to be your God. And God goes through great links with Israel, with Babylon, and with Nebuchadnezzar to point them all back to God. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar's great moment was, God, I recognize that you are the only giver of mercy, and he's immediately restored back to lordship. Belshazzar, who was never going to get to that place, of recognizing God as that, God just completely takes him out. But it was his pride and it was his arrogance. Now this isn't a message challenging your pride or challenging your arrogance. This is a message that I hope your takeaway is that as you sit and think, what does this mean for me today? I just want you to ask the question, is God my God? And if the answer is yes, fantastic. Show him, tell him you love him, surrender something to him. If the answer is no, don't freak out. It's not going to be a hand to follow you home. Uh, you're not going to turn into a cow tomorrow. But maybe think about, wow, if this God is so passionate about people knowing Him that He would work through, through the Israelites and even through their enemies, I mean, how much more does God love us that He sent Jesus to die on the cross for us? See, what God did back then there was nothing that could explain why God would reach out to Nebuchadnezzar. But what God does with us now is easy to explain because Jesus died for our sins. That's easy. 
And so we have access to a God that sent His Son to die for our sins. And I just want you to ask yourself this question today. Is God my God? Let's bow our heads here and and we're going to pray as we close. And then after this, I'll have our prayer team come up front. And uh, they're just there for you. And the reason we do this final song and we call up our prayer team is I just want to give you a moment before the service ends, before we leave, before things you know go crazy, as soon as you leave the room, life kind of catches up to you. I want to give you a moment to reflect. I just want you to have a little bit of a moment to reflect on what was said today. And if anything comes up in you that's confusing or you think, I don't quite understand that, or maybe God brings up something to your heart and you want to talk to somebody about that or get prayer about that, well, that's why our prayer partners are up front for you, just so that you can have a person to connect with. We're not going to solve your problems or change your world, but we can stand in the middle of it with you, and we can journey with you.